I'd like to welcome you today uh, to our breakfast host. She is the Senator for South Australia, the Honourable Penny Wong. Now, Penny is the leader of the opposition in the Senate. She is the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs and she is and continues to be an inspirational leader and role model for young Australian women and the migrant community here in South Australia. Penny is always advocating for women and women's issues in the community and we thank her for her continued support of the IWD Breakfast. This year is in fact her 18th year as host. Can you please join me in welcoming to the stage Senator Penny Wong. Thank you very much, Sonia. Can I acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their res spiritual relationship with country? Thank you, Rosemary, for your welcome to country. I also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. And I pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people joining us from other areas of Australia. <clears throat> Well, as Sonia said, we continue to be the biggest IWD event in Australia. Congratulations, Adelaide. And not only are there 2,500 of you in this hall, we're reaching beyond this hall online, uh, including to the Women in Business and Regional Development event in, in Mount Gambier. Hello, Mount Gambier. So our breakfast book's out within hours of tickets being released and a book for a seat at the table to join so many like-minded women and young women in celebrating who we are tells us something very significant. You see, we want to celebrate the extraordinary achievements and progress that women have made. We want to recognise the courageous women who paved the way for us and we want to rededicate ourselves to the project of achieving true gender equality. And it fills my heart to have so many of you dedicated to that project, as your enthusiasm this morning confirms. It also heartens me that we have so many leaders of the South Australian community here today signalling their commitment to that project. So I acknowledge first the Professor Brenda Wilson, the Governor's Deputy, the Deputy Premier Vicky Chapman, representing the Premier Stephen Marshall, uh, Peter Malinowskis, the Leader of the Opposition, Leader of the Labor Party here in South Australia, Ms. Mrs. Carolyn Power representing Michelle Lynn Sink, the Right Honourable, the Lord Mayor of Adelaide, Sandy Vershaw, of course Liz Broderick, AO, our wonderful guest speaker, Professor Colin Sterling, VC, Flinders University, Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, Deputy VC, University of South Australia, uh, Mike Brooks, Provost, representing uh, Peter Rathjen, uh, from Adelaide University, of course, Rosemary. And can I particularly thank Anne Morgan, Chairperson of the Adelaide w IWD Breakfast Committee and all the wonderful committee members, and if you'll permit me, my wonderful staff led by Meredith Boyle, who have done all the work to put this together. Can I also acknowledge my mum and my aunts who are here. I was raised and nurtured by strong women for which I am eternally grateful. We're joined this morning by young women from the Townday Aboriginal College and I want to offer these students a particularly warm welcome along with the other 335 students from 28 other schools who joined us this morning. And I say to these young women, this day belongs to women everywhere and it also belongs to you. You see, so much of our work as feminists must be dedicated to supporting and enabling other women, including the next generation. Because just as we are the beneficiaries of the courageous, persistent women who came before us, fighting for equality, we must always be looking to help pave the way for those who follow us whether it's in our families, our workplaces, the public square or social media, we do need to have each other's backs. And that's why that support for each other is as important as ever. And with the scale of our challenge seeming to be especially stark lately, I hope you will allow me to be a little more pointed in my comments this morning. The true scourge of family violence and violence against women was rendered with horrifying clarity by the murder of Hannah Clark 
and her three children, Alia, Liana, and Trey. Within days of that murder, another woman was murdered in her home in Townsville, in another case of family violence. And we owe it to those victims to do more than mourn, because they are not isolated incidents. On average, a woman a week is murdered by her current or former partner. One in four women in Australia experience emotional abuse by a current or former partner since the age of 15. One in five have experienced sexual violence since the age of 15. It is well past time that we recognise violence against women is an epidemic in this country. And it is well past time for us to marshal the resources and the political will to deal with it, starting with the National Summit. And we must also always stand up to public figures who seek to minimise or rationalise violence against women and challenge political leaders who seek to undermine hard-fought progress, particularly in the area of family law. We were once a leader in global, global leader in gender equality, but in recent years, on the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index, Australia has fallen from 15th to 44th. This week, the think tank per capita has compiled a report on gender equality in Australia. It reminds us that only 16% of graduates in science, technology and maths are women. Women still earn less than men, on average $241.50 a week. Women hold 13.7% of chair positions and one quarter of directorships in large businesses and represent just 17% of CEOs and barely a third of key management personnel. And here in South Australia, we also have work to do. We can expect soon there will be a bill to decriminalise abortion. In the meantime, the member for Hurtle Vale, Nat Cook, has reintroduced a safe zones bill to protect service providers and protect women facing intimidation when they are making such difficult choices. And I urge all my state colleagues, many of whom are, who are here today, and I thank you for your attendance, to support these efforts to allow women to make their own choices. I look forward to seeing South Australian Labor, led by Peter Malinowskis, continuing Labor's tradition of reform, modernisation, and prioritising first the health and safety of South Australian women. Surely in 2020, we have got to a point when we realise these are difficult personal choices and we respect the rights of women to make these choices for themselves. And similarly, I express, I register my disappointment that the parliament here in South Australia failed to decriminalise sex work when legislation was presented last year. Criminalisation of sex work disproportionately disadvantages women, often those who are most vulnerable amongst us, and I hope it will be reconsidered in the near future. But of course, there is legislative reform and then there is cultural change. And underlying so much of our challenge has always been the fundamental question of respect for women. And I am particularly grateful to Liz Brod Broderick who's for being here today, whose work has been so focused on bringing men to the table as champions of change. Of course, we have come far. And as well as acknowledging the work that is still to be done, we must celebrate all that we have collectively achieved. Across the generations, women have fought for equality. Our great-grandmothers fought the battle for suffrage. Our grandmothers fought for the right to work. Our mothers fought for the right to equal pay for equal work. And we continue the fight for a woman to have the right to own her own body and to have reproductive choices. And our daughters will continue the fight for a culture that truly respects women as fully realised individuals, living without fear and with all the options and opportunities of our sons. Ultimately, women's full participation in our society can only be achieved when women are confident and secure in their most basic rights. And that is why we need to invest in women's economic security, health and education, and to ensure a world free from gender-based violence. And that is why we continue to support the work of organisations like UN Women. Because just as we here in Australia recognise that gender, unfinished, gender equality is unfinished business, we are keenly aware that even greater challenges face women around the world where far less progress has been made. And just as we owe it to younger women here in Australia to lead the fight for them, we owe it to women less fortunate than we are over the world for us to do what we can. 
So it is particularly important that the proceeds, proceeds from this event go to supporting the work that UN Women Australia is doing, primarily in the Asia Pacific region. As Sonia said, this is my 18th year hosting this breakfast. Last year, we raised $60,000 to improve the lives of women in our region, and this year we are hoping for more. So can I thank you again for getting up early, for being here with us today, for your continued support for this breakfast, but most of all, for your continued support for the cause that it champions. Thank you very much. Thank you to Senator Wong. Well, as she mentioned, this year, uh, we welcome to join us in celebrating International Women's Day our speaker, Elizabeth Broderick. Elizabeth has brought together captains of industry, sport, governments and defence force chiefs to address gender inequality in Australia and beyond. As Australia's longest serving sex discrimination commissioner between the years 2007 to 2015, Elizabeth worked tirelessly to break down structural and social barriers faced by women and men and to promote gender equality. Her review into the treatment of women in the Australian Defence Force led to sweeping cultural reforms. She established and convenes the globally recognised Male Champions of Change strategy, enlisting a who's who of powerful male leaders to tackle workplace gender inequality. She is a powerful and influential voice in the struggle for gender equality, enlisting both men and women as agents of change. In 2017, Elizabeth was appointed by the United Nations in Geneva as a special mandate holder and independent expert on discrimination against women. She is a member of the Council for the Order of Australia, and in 2016, Elizabeth was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia and was named 2016 New South Wales Australian of the Year. She is an honorary fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. She holds honorary doctorates of law from the University of Sydney, the University of New South Wales and University of Technology Sydney, and honorary doctorates from Deakin, Edith Cowan and Griffith Universities. I'm sure we will have plenty uh, to in listen to with Elizabeth. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Elizabeth Broderick. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Your Excellency, Senator Wong, so many distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's such an absolute pleasure to be invited this morning to the in Adelaide International Women's Day breakfast in support of UN Women Australia. Thank you, Auntie Rosemary, for such an entertaining and also moving welcome to Ghana country. I too pay my respects to elders past and present uh, and emerging and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the audience today. Thank you for your leadership, your custodianship, your care of this land for so many thousands of years, and thank you for your strong voice on equality. We have so much to learn. Now, coming into here today, I thought, my gosh, Adelaide knows how to throw a fabulous International Women's Day breakfast. And don't report me back in Sydney, but can I say this is the best International Day breakfast in Australia? <laughs> now, some might surmise that that's because South Australians love to party whatever time of a day or night, but I would posit to you that it's because South Australians care about gender equality. You have such a strong and proud history of protecting women's human rights. You were the first Australian state to give women the right to vote in 1984. And not only that, you cemented our place in history with Australia the second country in the world following on from New Zealand to give women the vote. So thank you, South Australia. That's something for us all to celebrate. As for many of you, my career has taken me all over the world. From Addis Ababa to Adelaide, from the refugee camps on the Greek islands of Lesbos to the women's refuges in Launceston, from 200 metres under the sea in a submarine to camping out within Aboriginal women in the northern Australia, from the slaughterhouse production lines in Murray Bridge to the mountains and valleys of Afghanistan, 
It has taken me to remote communities, to company boardrooms, to small but powerhouse community organisations, to schools, to government agencies, the Parliament, the Pentagon, NATO, the United Nations, the World Bank and everywhere in between. And the great joy of my life is that every day I am privileged to work with people who want to create a more equal world. Just two years ago, I was appointed by the United Nations in Geneva as their Special Rapporteur on Discrimination Against Women and Girls and a member of the UN Working Group. This role requires me to undertake country missions on behalf of the United Nations and to draw to the attention of nation states human rights violations against women and girls in their nation. Like many of you, I suspect, I came into this role, a big role, wondering if I had what it takes. I was trepidatious, not knowing, would I be good enough? Would I be able to have impact? But absolutely prepared to give it my all. And I've learned so much, so much, mostly through listening closely to the stories of women, learning from their wisdom, learning from their resilience. And in particular, I'm thinking of the mothers I meet in African nations who are pulling their daughters out of school because fetching firewood and water for the family takes so much, so much longer without basic infrastructure and it's only getting worse with the changing climate. Why is it that in 2020, women and girls are paying the price of poverty and climate change. And I'm thinking of the feminist policymakers in Latin America who can no longer use the word gender, the term gender, in any official policy documents. Or the academics in Eastern Europe who've had their whole university curriculum and courses abolished because gender studies and gender and development is an ideology, not a science. Why is it that in 2020, the term gender is so controversial? Or the young girl raped in North America who will no longer have access to abortion and any doctor who offers to assist will now risk life imprisonment. Why is it that in 2020, we can't offer basic access to safe abortion as a basic human right? And I'm thinking of the elderly women in the Asia Pacific region, labelled as witches, exiled to the margins of their communities and forced to remain confined in safe spaces, living in deplorable conditions and experiencing the worst forms of exclusion. Why is it that in 2020, horrific levels of violence, exclusion and stigma persist for women all across the world? And then I'm thinking of back here in Australia, as Senator Wong said, I'm thinking of the stories of the women living with violence every day, the more than one woman a week who loses her life at the hands of her intimate partner, the women paid less than their male colleagues for work of equal or comparable value, those women promoted less but sexually harassed more. The fact that these inequalities and violations persist today is bewildering. Women's stories demand change and transformation. We must bring the private sphere which women inhabit into the public domain and create shared accountability for change. The lived experience of inequality, of exclusion, of hardship, that matters. It's the women's stories that will ultimately call us to action. 25 years ago, the fourth Women's World Conference was held in Beijing. It was the largest ever gathering of governments and women's rights activists. At that meeting, world leaders adopted what we now call the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the most comprehensive and transformative global agenda for the achievement of gender equality that the world had ever seen. We now recognise 1995 as a high point in our global progress on women's rights. 
25 years on, whilst there's been good progress in some areas, such as reducing maternal mortality, increasing young women's access to education, particularly in primary school, and the rise of young women's activism, while there's been progress in those areas, in other areas we've regressed. And at the heart of this regression is discrimination. Discrimination lies at the heart of all inequality faced by women, regardless of our identity or status. It operates systematically in all spheres of women's lives and is by no means accidental. Discrimination is indeed political and it happens by design. Structural discrimination, which exists in both the public and private realms, reflects an underlying power imbalance intended to suppress women and regulate them to an inferior status, whether through what may be perceived as an innocuous denial of certain rights, to harmful stigma and marginalization, to extreme forms of violence and femicide. Gender inequality, which is the result of these forms of discrimination, is exacerbated by its intersection with other factors such as poverty, racism, sexual orientation, ageism and disability. Who you are and where you sit in the world determines your access to resources and power. So there's no question that women with less power, those that are more marginalised, will be impacted by gender inequality to a much greater degree. Last year, my working group released a global thematic report examining the global backlash on women's rights across the world. Interestingly, despite a very detailed legal analysis in our report, it was the most cited of any of our reports across the UN system. Because our country visits have started to reveal an unprecedented pushback across all the regions of the world by an alliance of radical, conservative, political, strongman ideologies and extremist religious fundamentalists. The anti-gender movement is growing with its funding and resources coming from all corners of the world. It has as its focus the so-called protection of a family, protection of culture, protection of religion and tradition. It is in this context of rising fundamentalism and backlash that the discourse on women's sexual and reproductive rights is increasingly contested at the international level. Too many women are being deprived of their sexual and reproductive health and rights. For girls, pregnancy and childbirth is one of the most common causes of death in developing nations, with girls under 15 years of age facing five times the danger of death. As a result of unsafe abortions, each year some 47,000 women die and a further 5 million suffer. So I want you to understand to, that today the world stands at a crossroads with the very concept of gender equality and women's rights becoming increasingly contested. But despite all this, I have cause for immense optimism because as well as those resisting equality all across the globe, we're also witnessing new and creative forms of civic participation and action, from the Me Too social movement to extended women's marches. In particular, leading civil society organisations are evolving with many young women included and often leading as powerful agents of change. We are seeing them catalyse new movements that have swept the globe in calling for equality, for democracy, economic and climate justice. They are linking issues such as violence against women to other movements, including workers' rights and reproductive rights. We've seen them flooding the streets, the airwaves and the internet with their energy, their testimonials, bringing to light truths that are often buried in darkness. We are seeing them take on powerful forces, calling for accountability and action and achieving powerful victories for the protection of their communities and the world that we all share. Young women's growing activism is such a shining light in an otherwise dimming world. That's why generation equality, the theme for this International Women's Day, is, is so important. It's about reaching out and building alliances and solidarity across generations. It's absolutely vital for our continued progress. 
So I thought I might finish now with just telling you what a few of the things that I've learnt along the way. I mean, I think the most empowering thing that I've learnt, and particularly for the young women in the audience, is you don't have to be extraordinary to create change. I'm certainly not. I now recognise that changing the world is about doing what you can when you can. It's about the small actions that you take that become powerful levers of change. That's what it takes, and it's an empowering mantra to live by. Do what you can when you can. That's how you change the world. The second thing I've learned is that change happens when we all work together. Governments, business, academia, unions, civil society organisations. As one beautiful young human rights defender I met in Ethiopia told me last, week, uh, last month, she said, Liz, you do your part and know that I will do mine. This year, as chair of the working group and the lead rapporteur on discrimination against women and girls across the world, I will develop an initiative to gather a million reasons why discrimination and gender equality should stop. And there are literally billions of reasons out there. As one young woman in India told me recently, she said, I want discrimination to stop so that, that I am offered as much food as my brother. This million reasons why is one legacy I'm determined to leave. Because what is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of stories and voices, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. Change doesn't happen in one giant leap, but rather when decent men and women across the world tell their stories, hold nations and other institutions accountable for their treatment of women and girls. That's when we'll see a big shift. And thirdly, I've learned that the progress that I've come to see today, it came about because women I will never know cared enough to stand tall and demand change in order that future generations of women and girls could live much more empowered lives. Every day I use their courage, the courage of women and activists that have come before me to fuel my activism I use their stories to fuel a global systemic response. Every one of us, men and women, and particularly those in power, we have a responsibility to speak, to use our power and influence to drive change, to celebrate women's achievements equally with men, to demand, to demand women's equal place in industries and nations. And finally, across my life, one of the most important lessons I've learnt is about the importance of self-care. Several months ago, I led the UN's mission to Greece. And I spent time in the refugee camps on the Greek islands, particularly in Moria camp on the island of Lesbos, a camp built for 1,500 people, now holding 15,000. It was here that I interviewed women from Syria, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan and Turkey. Women whose stories of sexual violence, either on the transit to Lesbos or indeed in the camp, were unspeakable. Over the years, I've often talked about the importance of self-care, but words are cheap. It's the actions we take which speak volumes about who we are. Caring for oneself encompasses a deeper self-awareness and self-knowledge. It's often also about some kind of quiet practice. For me, that's about mindfulness and meditation. For you, it might be about um, faith or prayer or being in nature or silence. It's absolutely about connection with family and friends, the interrogation of our hopes and fears. It's about being good enough whilst holding the enormity of what needs to shift with gentle hands. And listening to those women's stories in the refugee camp, I felt absolute despair. I felt absolutely powerless to create change I was, or, or to help them heal. But it was those women that taught me that how I turn up, how I bear witness, that matters. Not only that, they taught me that being well, both physically and mentally, is the ultimate act of women's empowerment. And indeed, in many countries, it's the ultimate act of political defiance. 
They taught me that inner power radiates and it energizes others. Self-care is never a selfish act. It's the stewardship of the gift you were put on the earth to offer others. So in moments of self-doubt as I do my work, um, and there are many moments of self-doubt, I remind myself that who I am is enough, that I have everything I need right here, right now, to create the change I want to see in the world. And of course, that sounds fine in theory, but I can assure you it's very much a work in progress. But I have to say, I'm enjoying every minute of my new life, and I've never felt more alive, more connected, more powerful. So to every one of us in the room today who cares about gender equality, cares about um, driving positive change, what can we do? Well, to mums and dads, all the parents in the room, anyone who has children in their lives, respect and equality starts at home. I always say human rights starts at home. You shape the expectation of your daughters, the attitudes of your sons, what you model, whether as a couple of opposite or same sex or as a sole parent, your children will take into their adult lives. And to each of you leading in business, those with power, call out sexism and disrespect. Enable men to access flexible work as a fundamental, not a favour. Never allow a woman's pregnancy to jeopardise her place at work. Build a culture where dignity and respect lie at the core. And to all those men in the room, those men who are standing with us as strong allies, those men who love their partners, their daughters, their mothers and sisters, we are all in this together. 25 years on from Beijing, accountability for progress cannot sit on the shoulders of women alone. Women and girls need men and boys as allies to stand with them, to take action and equal accountability for change. And to those women who have led the way, every one of you in the room today, every one of you has, who has gone above and beyond, and there are so many of you, I stand in awe of what you have done and what you continue to do. So from the core of my being, a very big thank you. So I just want to now, just before I step down, because I don't want to leave you on a downer note, so let me just finish with one final story. I'm in Islamabad now, facilitating a small round table for members of the media. One young man, Syed, has traveled all the way from the dangerous Fatah region, which was, is on the border with Afghanistan, the disputed territories. He wants to tell me that he is including gender equality content into his weekly broadcasts, broadcasting out through radio medium wave to tr Taliban and tribal elders. He's encouraging them to send their daughters to school, to stop using violence against women. I'm so inspired. I feel like jumping across the table and hugging him. And instead I say, Sayed, how did the universe deliver you to us every day? you take actions which put yourself at risk. His simple response to me was, I come from a large family, seven uh, sisters and one brother. My parents are very poor, so they could only uh, send two of us to school, and they chose to send, send my brother and I. When we were old enough, my brother and I, one day on the way to school, we made a pact we agreed that if we ever became influential in the world, we would use our influence to empower women. Because after all, if we did that, our seven sisters might also one day have a chance at an education. And then as he was turning to leave, he said to me, and after all, Liz, what future do I want for my own daughter? What future do I want for the daughters of our world? Thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. Namarni. Namarni well done. <laughs> My name is Anne Morgan. I am the chair of the Adelaide International Women's Day Breakfast Committee. It's my pleasure to thank Liz for accepting Senator Wong and the committee's invitation to speak to us here this morning. I can't help but be impressed by Liz's career and her achievements. It's another thing, though, to hear it personally here this morning um, and to tell us about what she has been through and all of the work that she has done. And I think on behalf of everybody in this room, Liz, yes, you are enough. In fact, you are an inspiration to all of us here. And we, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of the work that you have done and that you continue to do on behalf of gender equality. There are a few people I would like to acknowledge this morning for making this breakfast possible. Uh, Penny, Senator Wong, thank you for hosting this event again this year um, and also for allowing us access to your fantastic staff in your office. Without your support and their help, we wouldn't be able to do all of this. Sonia Feldhoff, our NC, is doing a fantastic job of keeping everybody under control and keeping us all on point. Thank you, Sonia, and also thank you to Rosemary for your um, educational, as always, um, and hilarious welcome to country this morning. Thank you. In particular, I want to thank the other members of the committee, um, especially uh, Meredith Boyle, as Penny said. She is a powerhouse of a woman. She knows nearly all of your names off by heart, and we really appreciate all of your help. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this morning, we're also joined by a number of volunteers. There are students from UniSA, from University of Adelaide, and we also have some volunteers here assisting UN Women Australia. We are grateful to all of you for your support. One of the things that we're especially proud of, not just that we are the largest event in the country, but in fact, um, we raise a huge amount of money for UN Women, as Penny said. And we are grateful for all of our sponsors, our supporters, each of you that brought corporate tickets, but, but everybody that bought a ticket here today, um, we really appreciate your support and, and so that then we can support UN Women and the fantastic work that they do in the Asia Pacific region. One of the things I'm really passionate about is digital technology and digital transformation. And we have used technology to transform this breakfast over the past 10 years or so. Um, in particular, we've worked this year with Hoban Recruitment to organize a live stream of the entire event. It's allowed us to connect with people in Mount Gambia and uh, other regional events, with schools, with organizations, um, and I know in particular that there's a, a couple of uh, watchers in Ireland uh, that are watching. So hello, mum. Uh, <laughs> um, but also um, uh, my daughter, Ashling, she's uh, 10 years old. Um, she is one of the social justice leaders at her school. Uh, she's arranged for them to meet this morning and to talk about UN Women and gender equity. Um, so I'm really proud of you, Ash, and all of the work that you are doing. Um, you are the future and you are the generation that we are doing this for. In a few minutes after my, um, my little talk, um, we're going to see a trailer for a new movie that's about to come out. It's called I Am Woman. Um, it is um, a movie about Helen Reddy. It's a biopic chronicling her story and how the song, I Am Woman, became the rallying cry for women's liberation movement in the 70s. Uh, the Adelaide screening for this is going to be held on Wednesday the 29th of April at the Palace Nova East End. And we're going to work and help support UN women with this. 100% of, uh, of the ticket price for each ticket that's sold will go to UN Women Australia. So I encourage you to check that out, hop on to UN Women's website, grab your tickets for that one, and hopefully we will see you there. When we were meeting with our volunteers yesterday, we spoke to them about the history of this breakfast and this event and why it's really important to us. 
The breakfast started 28 years ago with the support of our dear friends Rosemary Crowley and Heather Southcott. And it struck me at the time about how much work we do in order to set this up every year. And, and I mention this because this is what women do all of the time. So in addition to undertaking the lion's share of work at home and doing the emotional labor, a lot of us have very demanding and very successful careers. We volunteer our time and efforts to additional activities that we're really passionate about. We mentor and we sponsor our colleagues at work and we support them to prepare for new opportunities and promotions that might be coming up. We establish groups and committees and we celebrate and support our colleagues and we network as much as we can. And we also call it out when we hear mansplaining and inappropriate language and we try our best to educate others and to explain what more respectful behavior and language is. Like Liz, sometimes when I speak to people about gender equality, I sometimes get the response, there's not much I can do. I'm not in the management group and, and I have no influence and I can't make a difference. The fact is, as Liz mentioned, this is about cultural change and it's, it's really, really hard. It's not simple to do. We've been having this breakfast for 28 years to talk to people, to celebrate International Women's Day, and we're still doing it. And we're nowhere near gender equality. We can't wait for anybody else to do this for us. We all have the power to bring about this change. And as we make this progress, we can't take our foot off of the pedal for one second. Change only comes about from action. And so I'm going to ask each of you to do something today. As we heard, there's over two and a half thousand people in this room, and there's countless others watching the live stream. And if each of us here today leaves and does just one thing, that's over two and a half thousand actions. And that could actually bring a significant change to cultural perceptions and to gender equality. So it might be talking to a colleague about the breakfast when you get back to work. It might be mentioning that you've been to the breakfast. It might be um, what is International Women's Day and why do we celebrate it? Why do we wear our purple ribbons to celebrate? It could be returning back to your school, talking about it with your classmates, watching Liz and Penny's speeches again later, encouraging your children to do whatever job they want to do when they grow up, challenging the perception that pink is for girls and blue is for boys. You might not know this, and I only found this out yesterday, International Women's Day is actually a public holiday in 26 countries around the world. It's not in Australia yet. Um, and, and I know this yesterday because our friends at BPW Adelaide um, are calling on uh, Premier Stephen Marshall to add the observance of International Women's Day to the current March public holiday. Yep. So I encourage you all to get behind that movement and to show your support for that. And maybe next year, on top of having another fantastic event in Adelaide and the largest event in the country, maybe we'll also be the first state to observe International Women's Day as a public holiday. And if we can make this commitment, and if we can do this today, and we can do it tomorrow, and we can do it all of the days between now and the 8th of March in 2021, that change is going to continue to grow. And if we start doing that, other people are going to start doing it as well. So we're not just waiting for change to happen. We, in fact, are the change. We are generation equality, and we can bring about this change together. Thank you all very much.